Do you think you have a badass kayak? Do you think it's going to turn some heads? Saturday, March 25th, Jake Spate and Tackle is hosting a kayak show and seminar. The kayak show starts at 1030. They'll be giving away $500 worth of prizes. The categories are the youth division, 18 and under, the DIY division, if you put $1,000 or less into the kayak, the best river kayak setup, the best big water kayak setup, and then the best in show. If you're interested, you can bring your kayak out. It costs $5 and all the money goes to the Frederick County Bass Club. If you're interested, email information at jakespaintandtackle.com to register. Again, email information at jakespaintandtackle.com to register. On top of that, we're going to have seminars throughout the day. At 1130, we'll have Mike Ortega talking about kayak tournament fishing 101. At 1230, we'll have Sela Johnson talking about intro to kayak fishing. At 130, we'll have Josh Evans talking about rhyme and reason and how to rig the perfect kayak. And of course, Fishing the DMV will be there to live stream it. Again, that's Saturday, March 25th at Jake's Bait and Tackle. Doors open at 1030 for the kayak show. Stay for all the seminars, the food, and watch the Bassmaster Classic. We'll see you there. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Aarons, Mount Division, the Shenandoah Division. Um, and you know Billy Cole's an episode talking about his intro into this BFL, this Piedmont Division one. Then I thought it'd be kind of cool to get somebody on in that tournament. Uh, and what's so cool about this individual, he finished not only in the top 10, but he finished seventh. Uh, dude, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, dude. Thank you for having me. This is, uh, this is exciting. No, I, again, like it was short notice. I remember I just messaged you out of out of nowhere, being like, "This is a long shot, but hey, would you like to come on?" And then, I, I mean, like, just tell the people like what got you in this and kind of your story. Yeah, so um, I was kind of a late bloomer when it came to it. Um, I started fishing when I was like eleven or twelve, maybe, and uh, just fish from the dock. My mom used to wake up at like six a.m. before work, and we'd go down to the dock, and she'd roll bread balls and we'd catch bluegill and stuff. And then um, I kind of got introduced to the tournament fishing. Um, I remember the exact video. I looked up how to cast a bait caster and it was flare and uh, just went on kind of a dark hole and found Scott Martin and got all in that. And then when I moved to Virginia, I was in Tampa. Um, I was born in Florida. Oh, dude. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So I moved to Williamsburg. Uh, my dad works for Bush Gardens. So we got transferred up here. And uh, when I moved here, like I didn't really know anyone. So all I did was fish um, and kind of just got involved in the tournaments. And yeah, it's been a it's been a journey so far. Did you fish a lot in Florida? I didn't barely at all. It uh, really? it pains me. Yeah, I uh, I fished a little bit like I had a little pond prowler and a, a lake in my neighborhood. And I'd mess around. I'd pretty much tie on a horny toad. And that was all I knew how to throw. And I'd throw it year round. And uh, yeah, so I, it, it sucks. But I didn't really get into it until I moved to Virginia. That is so crazy that you didn't. So it wasn't even like you were already a fishaholic by the time you no. got to Virginia. It, it's Virginia that kind of got you into it. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I I, and I, even when I moved to Virginia, like it's so fun. Like I, I had no clue what I was doing. And uh, I'm pretty much all self-taught. Uh, with YouTube and my dad didn't really fish, you know, night crawlers and stuff like that. And like I said, my mom. Um, so it was watching YouTube and, and applying it. And that's how I grew up fishing pretty much. Where around, where around that area did you fish? In that Florida? Really got you hooked? Uh, no, uh, in Virginia. So I am in Williamsburg. I've been there since we moved and um, I live right on the Chickahominy river. Oh dude. Kind of nice. fishing from the, bank and ponds and i had a small lake in my neighborhood um but i finally got a we got a nitro fishing ski my dad bought it and uh so i kind of started to get to poke around on the chick and stuff and then i got my own boat a few years ago and uh been hitting it hard as i can how did that happen how did you go from basically pond prowler in florida to bass boat so i worked my way up um the pond prowler and i have that's my one recommendation to any kids is get a pond prowler because you can beat them up. You can throw them in the back of a truck. You could, you can do anything you want. And then, uh, a few years later, actually one of my best buddies now, uh, Matt Streichel, uh, he's uh, SP fishing TV, um, watching him is his John boat videos. It, he hyped me up. So I got a John boat 
and then put a deck on it, trolling motor, kind of a few graphs with just, you know, sonar and then worked my way up. Um, met a really good guy at Bass Pro Shops. I worked there for a year um, in 2020 and he was selling a tracker and he gave me a great deal. So I jumped on that, uh, fished that for a few years, won a couple of tournaments out of it. And dude, nice. I, it was, dude, I, it was just unbelievable. Yeah. Won a, an ABA and a couple of local tournaments out of it. Well, and, where? And, and, where? ABA wise, what, what, what ABA did you win? ABA, I fished uh, in my backyard on the chick. Oh, dude. Yeah. Out of the tracker. It was, it was nuts. Um, yeah, that kind of that tournament kind of changed. I mean, honestly, it felt like it changed my life because I got to prove to the people I look up to that I fish against that, you know, I'm I'm here and I can do it. And uh, the biggest thing was I proved it to myself um, that, you know, I can compete locally. And yeah, that was that was a huge win. We all need that in our lives as anglers, um, because you do have those thoughts when you fish tournaments and you get your butt kicked. It's like, you know, do I belong or whatever? Exactly. Until you get your first win, and it doesn't matter what level, but once you have a win, you almost feel like, ah, I can actually, I know how to do this. Yep, exactly. And to win, win that, um, I think it was 40 or 50 boats, and and it's 40 or 50 guys of the best guys on that river um, that I don't even know how much experience, but way more than I had up to that point. I think that was my first year fishing that that river. So, it, But on that day, yep. it's all needed. Dude, I'll, uh, quick story, dude. Um, just kind of how that day went. It was one of the most insane, honestly, only second to this BFL. Um, I pulled up and there were boats all over my spots. I had to kind of scramble and uh, I jumped, I got into a frog pattern. Um, and every creek mouth I went up to until nine o'clock, I caught a four pounder. It was, Holy it shit. was nuts. And when it's your time, it's your time. <laughs> dude, I know. And uh, so the week before, um, in a night tournament, I lost a, like a six pounder on a, um, on a, I, I threw a seven, four frog rod. That's what I was rocking with. And I lost it. And, uh, kind of my mentor, Ron Crum, he's like, he's like, you need to throw an eight footer. So I picked up an eight foot three, uh, Mike Buka rod from Dobbins. And that was my, that was my frog rod. And I, so I won that tournament on a swim bait rod, throwing a, a KR frog. Dude, that is freaking awesome. It was, it's nuts. You can't make that up. No, dude. It just, like you said, when it's your time, it's your time. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it. It is. Like, I remember the one, I won an ABA um, on the Potomac, and I remember that the fish that's, that cinched it was almost a five and a half pounder on a, on a, on a lipless bait, but I snagged it on the, on the side and it mm -hmm. was just, it had one back treble hook. That was it. And it never came off. And you just, I thought about that every day. I think since then, it's like, Nine times out of 10, that fish jumps and it's gone. But yep. that day it didn't happen. And it's just, uh, you can't, if it's your time, it is your time. And on this, on the same note with that, I know that you had another tournament like this that we're going to get into here shortly. Uh, is this the same boat, this tracker that you used at this tournament? Or is so, there some more stuff that happened in between? Yeah, there's a couple more things. Um, I ended up selling the tracker after that year. Um, I just outgrew it. Uh, I, kept, I, I was winning. I was making a little bit of money and uh, I wanted to move up to a glass rig. And uh, so now I sold that and now I have a, a Triton TR-186. Uh, it's actually 2004, so it'll be almost 20 years next year. Wow. So, uh, yeah, we're rocking with the with the old Triton. That's, dude, it still works. It's better yep. than, you know, a $200,000 brand new boat. <laughs> yep. And I, and I tell people all the time, I'm like, I won more money out of my tracker than I have, that I have this boat. Maybe not now, maybe not now, but, uh, no, but, but, but still, I, I think you make a good point. And this is, you know, a huge shout out to, um, you know, Mr. McCluskey and SB fishing guys yep. that I know that do the, the small aluminum boat thing. It really does show you the boat itself does not have to be you know, a hundred thousand yep. dollars. It's, it, it's you and what you put on the boat that really matters. And looking at, um, Lewis Minetti who just qualified for the classic, um, fishing out of, I think it was a 19 something Ranger with, with no graph. So it's, fit, it's absolutely crazy. Fish, fish, what you got. That's my, um, advice and, and focus on your fishing and, and you'll be all right. Now, how did you and SB meet? So I met him at a, at the Raleigh fishing show um a while back and i was honestly a fan um i love this stuff and 
And so I went up and I shook his hand and I was like, Hey man. And we, and we talked and, uh, kind of nothing came from it. And I saw him, I think on Chickahominy Lake and I hit him up and I told him, come to the store. And, uh, we kind of hit it off and we've been, we've been running around together ever since. Wow. And then at that point in time, you switched from Bass Pro Shop to this different store, right? I work for a company called Fishing Pro Tech. Um, we're located in Tulane, Virginia. Um, I'm the store manager. It's owned by Lynn Bell, who I met him. I don't even know when. It's been a while. But he was he was one of the first people that really believed in me and uh, took me under his wing and, and taught me a lot about the industry and the business. And uh, yeah, we carry mega bass, um, a lot of Shimano, high end stuff. Um, and we tried, our goal is we carry the everyday things that you need. We got Senkos, you know, we got Strike King, Guggen, that kind of stuff. But we have a lot of the hard to find mega bass colors. Um, we get a lot of zoom crankbaits in, like hard to find stuff, but we got the stuff that you need every day. And again, guys, as always, link in the episode description to everything we talk about so you can really help support Hunter. So then how do you go from the, the tracker Bass Pro Shop to, you know, working for this small company who then allows you to, to meet SB? And so it's so interesting how everything connects to get you to where you are. It's unreal. I mean, the, the universe works in, in crazy ways. But yeah, uh, yeah he, uh, he came to the shop and, and we hung out and... Uh, yeah, I've I've gotten to meet quite a few people through the store. Um, just some awesome people. So how'd you end up working there? I so like I said, I met him. At, I think I met him at a tournament on a local one, and kind of he was the first person to sponsor me, um, give me you know deals okay. on baits and stuff. Um, and then it was kind of funny. I was I was ready to leave Bass Pro uh, during COVID. It just it wasn't working out for me. Okay. And I actually went, I walked into the store and I was going to ask him for a job and he pulls out his address book with my name circled. And he was like, how would you feel about working here? Dude, I, You just <laughs> can't pick stuff up, man. It, it, it's so nuts. And so, and I'm like, that's why I'm here. I want to talk to you about doing that. So yeah, he brought me on and I, I think I've been, I'll be there three years in September. That's freaking wild, man. Yeah. That's wild. I mean, it's so cool how things they, they do. They just work out. And then yeah. so when did you and that's three. So it's been three years with that. You've been there. When did you have in your head you want to start doing like the BFL stuff? Kind of as soon as I got a, a boat that I could do it in, as soon as I got my tracker, um, I was like, I, I drew my schedule out. I'm like, I'm doing the BFLs. And uh, my mentor, he's like, he's like, why don't you fish local first? He's like, let's see how you stack up. And uh, the rule that he kind of told me was one in 10. So if you win one tournament out of 10, you're ready to move on to the next level. Okay. So I won, I won that ABA. Um, and then uh, later in the year, I won two tournaments back to back. So I ended up like winning three out of 20 something. So I was like, let's, uh, let's give the BFLs a shot. And were all these tournaments, were they on the chick? Most of them were um, the ABA um, we do Chickahominy, Kerr, and Gaston. So I got to kind of spread my wings a little bit and try against those hammers down there and uh, got my butt whooped, honestly. Well, and that's what's also so fascinating. Again, like this is so, guys, this is what also I love about this show is if I picked Hunter's name off, like just the lineup, like on my other screen here, I have like the stats from the tournament he, he did well in. It's just his name. It doesn't tell you that, by the way, he doesn't he doesn't fish consistently a deep water clear impoundment. He's made a lot of money on the Chickahominy River, and you, that would blow your mind to think like, how the hell did that happen? It's just like that's such a cool story there. Because yeah. um, again, spoilers like Smith Mountain Lake and Chick is not is not the same. <laughs> no, but um, actually, we'll get into it later. But the yeah. way I, the way I caught him was similar to something I do here at home. So that's it, crazy. it's, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, then let's get into it yeah. then. Like, so what, 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 I guess the backstory is like, how did you decide like, this is the year, are you fishing all of them, the Piedmont or are you just, okay. Yep. I'm fishing, uh, all five, hopefully all six. Well, hopefully all seven. Um, I, my goal, my only goal, and I said it, um, in my YouTube videos, my only goal is to make the regional. Um, I, w I said, I'd love to do well in the individual tournaments, but I want to see how I stack up on a, on a year. And, uh, I'd say we're off to a decent start for that. You're into a real decent start. And yeah. then 
so then approaching this, was this your first tournament of the year? First one. Yep. So, um, yeah, I haven't, I wanted to do some warm up tournaments, but with work and stuff, I, and I'm not a big winter fisherman. I don't like fishing when it's cold. And I'm from Florida. So I, uh, I didn't end up getting any. So this was the first term of the year. So then, yeah, I mean, the floor is yours. You said, uh, you wanted to start with your practice, right? Yeah. So we get down, we got down there, um, on Tuesday, me and SB rolled down and, uh, the, the biggest thing I took away from this tournament was trust your instincts a hundred percent because they're always going to lead you in the right direction. So first day, um, I kind of pulled into a pocket just because it was out of the wind and I wanted to film my intro for my video and I pull in and, uh, I, my goal was to find them shallow because I knew there's going to be a lot of guys fishing with live scope and stuff. And, and I, and I own live scope and I'm, and I'm good with it but that's not my strong suit by any means. So I wanted to find them shallow and um, I ran into this pocket just to get out of the wind and it was a clay bank and similar to how Kerr sets up where you have the clay and then a drop off. And I picked up a, a 110 and on like my third or fourth cast, I caught like three and a half, almost four. So that clued me in. And then um, practice was one of the best practices I've ever had. Um, I pretty much caught multiple threes and a couple fours every single day for three days straight. Um, mm. So, but that's all I could catch them on. I caught, I don't even, probably 30 something fish in practice and one fish came on a drop shot. Everything else was on a mega bass vision 110. Wow. What made you think that, like that the fish would relate like Smith, like they do at Kerr. Was there anything that just, there's a light bulb moment that like maybe this will work here? Not really. It was kind of just, I saw the clay on the bank and I was like, well, this is too shallow to fish. So I picked a jerk bait up and um, Kerr has these similar like clay banks and they drop off into deeper water. And I started working that jerk bait on the drop offs. And that first day, anywhere I pulled up, I caught a three and a half. It was, it was unbelievable. So, and then I know the weather going into that event. Um, so, uh, guys, if you don't know the, the Billy Coles, uh, Smith Mountain Lake, uh, fishing report, I think we recorded that Thursday night before BFL. So I know that like going into that event, like the weather was stable, but then it was probably going to become a shit show on Saturday, which it, it kind of sounded like it did, but the weights are still pretty good for the, for the top people. Yeah. Um, so going into that tournament on like a Friday, Saturday, what was your strategy going into it then? Was it just to hit the clay banks and then that's it? So going into it, um, we didn't practice Friday. It was it downpoured all day and it was blowing 2025. 20, so it was like nothing that we learned that day was going to be was going to help us. Um, and we were both catching good fish. So we just decided, you know, we were going to take the day off and kind of reset. Um, but going into it, I was honestly with the weather that came. Uh, I think Billy said we got close to like two inches of rain. It was, it was nuts. Um, I was going to be happy with 10 or 11 pounds. And I just, cause we had no clue what the weather was going to do to our fish. Um, we had a pretty, the Airbnb we stayed at had a really steep driveway and you look outside and it's just mud going down the driveway right into the lake. So we're like, the, the lake's going to get muddy. Um, it's going to get cold because it was, 40 something degrees and raining. So we, we had no idea what to expect. And I was like, if I can catch a limit, then I'm going to be, I'm going to be pretty happy with that. Dude, that's a great mindset to have though, about just trying to just, you're just trying to be consistent and you're trying to put a ball in play. You know, you're not trying to swing for the fence or anything like that. Do, do you, um, do you do any networking too? I don't, I'm, I'm big on, I'm a no information guy. I, I like doing it myself. Um, I'll, I'll talk with, you know, the guys I'm staying with, of course, me and me and Matt, we, we talked all week um, and sending each other pictures of fish and what we're catching them on. But other than that, I don't, I don't like talking to anyone. Yeah. And I guess that's the type of networking I mean is like when you're staying in with a house, a bunch of guys, because to me, it's a positive and a negative because I think if you are on a brand new body of water for everyone, and a great example is this when I had Harry on, who lives in Florida still, um, if you're fishing the Harris chain, you got six lakes, you almost need to network so you can narrow it down to be like, okay, it, it's big Harris that they're on and yeah. okay. Spend time there. But then on the same token, you go to like a cur or something and then you hear so much 
information in your head. It's almost like overload going into this. Did you have a lot of chatter in your house that kind of got in your head mentally? Like, I don't know, should I go do this? Should I go do that? Because it's working for them or, uh, do, do we, me and Matt work really well together. Um, I, we kind of left each other alone. Um, okay. like, like he, he found a creek that he really liked. And I was like, you won't see me in there. Like, that's all you, you found it on your own. And he was the same way. Like whatever I found, that's my stuff. And, and he wasn't going to, you know, come in on me or anything. And yeah. And I was, I'm not saying like you guys were come in on each other, yeah. but if he was like, I think like this type of fishing is working, it didn't lead you like, Oh, maybe I should try that. You stuck with what you like. And he stuck with his kind of okay. mostly. Yeah. Um, he did. It was the last day of practice. He caught, he texted me. Um, he caught a five off a brush pile and it didn't really click, but I pulled up to a brush pile I had and caught a five off of it on a drop shot, like within 30 minutes of him sending me that. So not necessarily working off what we were saying, but, um, I mean, it's hard not to, not to have that in the back of your head. So then did you think about putting brush piles into the rotation then possibly? I did. I did. And, uh, if you want to jump into the tournament, you'll kind of get a, yeah, get a piece of that. Um, go for it. So I'll just tell my story. So kind of got to the ramp and, uh, I was not, not excited about fishing, dude. It was blowing its <laughs> butt off. So, uh, um, I was kind of in the back of my mind, like if this gets rescheduled to April or something, that would, that wouldn't hurt me at all. Um, so I get to the ramp and I, I get, and I had three rods on the deck. I had two jerk bait rods and a drop shot. And I was going to kind of be dedicated to that. And so we blast off and it's rolling. Like I felt I had a older guy in my boat. He was awesome. Um, but I, I felt bad cause I was, I was going through those waves. I was not slowing down. But yeah, we had probably two or three footers um, at blast off and mm. pulled up on an island that I like near the dam and caught one on my first second cast on a jerk bait. And that that got that definitely eased the nerves a little bit, being only my second BFL. Um, so put that one in the boat. And then off like on the left side, if you look at the dam on the left side, there's these creeks that are they're all natural, no docks or anything. And um a lot of points and drop offs, rocky, you know, drop offs and stuff. And I kind of just rotated through that area, catching them on a jerk bait. And I, I was throwing, um, actually I got it. I got it right here. This was the jerk bait I was throwing. Oh man. I love those lips on it too, man. You can see that thing had yep. fought some wars for you. Yep. So, um, just throwing that around on at pretty much every point I came up, I came to, I caught a keeper and I probably had my limb around eight 30 or nine. Uh, my goal was to have a limit by noon. So I definitely, I was definitely feeling pretty good. Um, but yeah, probably I was catching smallmouth, largemouth. I think at one point I had four smallies in the, in the live well. Um, let me try everything. This yeah. Is, uh, oh, you are. Blah, blah, blah. I think it's up here. So go guys... all the way down, and to the those creeks right there. I right here. I kept rotating through all of those. Um, a lot of just natural bank. That's what I was kind of keying in on, and uh, those drop offs like we were talking about earlier. So how did you? And, and guys, for you guys that are not uh, watching on the YouTube channel right now, we have a, we have a map up of Smith Mountain Lake. Smith Mountain's got a shit ton of creeks and fingers, a yes. shit ton. Did you practice as in you drove around the lake to find all these areas or did you use like a Google Earth thing to help you out? So it's actually pretty, I'm not a, I'm not a Google, I'm not a map guy. I don't look at the map before I go to a tournament. Um, hmm. It just, it wigs me out. I, I got, you know, ADHD. So when I look at a map, I, <laughs> it's so hard for me to focus. Um, so I don't, I usually don't look at the map until I put the boat in the water and I pull it up on the graph. So I I've been to that area before when I fished high school tournaments, um, you know, in 2017, 2018, 2019. I didn't know you fished high school tournaments. Yeah, I fished, um, I fished some of the old FLW high school tournaments and just absolutely really? bombed. Uh, I, I was looking at it today and I, I weighed in. I was at Smith Mountain twice, and the first time I weighed in two fish, and the last time I weighed in one. So, but I, that's really cool, though. Like, yeah. did you 
And it was pretty much Smith Mountain like you went to? Yep. Yeah. Smith Mountain, Kerr, and Gaston were the were the ones we went to. Um, but I I struggled. I didn't really know what I was doing then. But um yeah. So Sorry, that, I got you off topic. No, yeah. You're good. And then, uh, <laughs> but I fished some of the same areas that I did in high school. So it, it <laughs> so I kind of knew I didn't know like what was there, but I knew I liked the look of it. And uh yeah, I kind of jumped those points and those creek mouths. And so it if you look, if you like we're looking at it now. There's so much area there, but luckily the sun with those mountains, a lot of those banks were shaded and they would not, they were not on shaded banks at all for me. Really? So that helped a lot with narrowing down where I was fishing. Um, if it didn't have sun on it, I was not stopping there, which isn't even something I figured out in practice. I just figured it out day of and kind of kept rolling with it. Um, that is so interesting. Yeah. So I, I didn't think the sun was going to play that much, but I would go down a bank and I could, I just, you just like that we were talking about instincts. I could just feel that I was wasting my time. So I would only fish areas with sun that was beating on the banks. How long did you want the sun to be there? Cause like, I mean, spoilers, like, you know, the sun, the sun gets higher in the sky. And so some of those places would they become not shady anymore and then the sun would hit it. Or are you looking for places that always had sunlight hitting it? even in the, the the ones that hit the sunlight immediate so i guess on the i guess that would be the western banks or the eastern banks whatever yeah, something it is. you know that. what i mean but yeah <laughs> was, but the mountains threw a curveball because the sun has to get higher to reach over those mountains so that is such a great observation a lot yeah. of the um a lot of the areas were kind of they stayed shaded a lot longer so i i keyed in on areas that were had sun on them pretty much the whole day okay yeah and you can see like the clay right here on this yep. one at least yeah yep that the points like that i i would catch a catch a keeper off of and uh usually it was a good one how did you position your boat were you casting to the bank and pulling it out or were you paralleling to keep it in a certain water column the whole time i was i was casting to the bank and working it off um I try really hard not to backboat my guys. Um, so I wanted to give my co as many opportunities as he could. Obviously I'm getting the first cast there, so I'm going to have more opportunities, but um, I really, yeah, I just kind of go down the bank and uh, I just worked it off those points and I was throwing the plus one. So it was getting a little deeper and dude, they were smashing it. Why, why did you decide with the plus one? What clued you into that? So I had two rigged up. I had a regular one and a plus one and I, they ate the plus one better that day. I don't know. They ate the regular one better all week. Um, but I couldn't get bit on the regular one on tournament day. That's interesting. So they were a little bit lower in the water column than they really, so. they really dropped down. Yeah. And it, it seems like a lot of fish were kind of in almost transition mode. Like I, I wasn't catching them super shallow and I wasn't catching them deep. They were right on those breaks. So it kind of seemed like they were, they could kind of do what they wanted. If they felt like going shallower, they could move up if they wanted to, if they wanted to move out a little deeper, they, they had that opportunity too. So I think the plus one kind of, kind of carries kind of can hit all those spots at the same time. And then by early morning, you had a full limit. I had a full limit, probably around nine or 10 and i kept culling until about 1 30. that's insane so this is this is kind of where the story goes crazy um so i had like that brush pile that i caught my biggest fish on a drop shot and it's up by this the state park where we would put our boats in and um so i'm like it's 1 30 i've got a limit that i'm happy with obviously i knew i needed to to gain on it um, so I run up to those brush piles and I take one cast and I look at my graph. No, no, I was about to leave to go to those brush piles. And I looked at my graph and it showed 11.2 volts on my starter. So I'm like, I really need to charge this battery. So I'm like, let me make the run. And, you know, it was so rough out. I put my graphs in the rod locker, my front ones, just because I just wanted to make just I didn't want the extra weight on my, you know, mounts. So I throw them in the rod locker and I get to my spot and my graph is reading. I think it was at like 12 even. And I go to throw my front graph on and it won't turn on. 
and it, and I look at my voltage again and it dropped down to the 11s and I'm like, this is, this is not good. So I took one cast cause like I didn't have my live scope cause the, the graph wouldn't turn on. So I took one cast trying to find the brush pile. I couldn't. And I'm like, I looked at my co and I'm like, dude, we got to go fish by the ramp for the last hour. I'm like, I, I don't know what else to do. I don't want to risk it and lose all those points. And, you know, since I'm trying to make the regional. So I get down there and something told me to pull out a glide bait and my mag draft. What? I don't know. Just like, where'd that gut feeling come from? So I, I'm a big mag draft guy and I throw it a ton at home and I catch a lot of fish on it and a lot of big fish. And I was like, if I'm a fishing near the ramp, I need to do something that's going to get me. I'm going for one bite pretty much. Like this is going to be my make or break. I'm happy with what I got. Um, I already kind of had a plan to throw a swim bait if I had a limit at the end of the day. So it was, they were ready to go. Um, I think I had like an Arashi glide or something like that. Um, so I, I get down and I, I look at my graph and I, and I went to grab it and it wasn't even plugged in. So it wasn't even that the battery was, you know, not letting the graph turn on. It just wasn't plugged in. So I'm like, all right, whatever. So I take my first cast of my glide bait. I have a fish come up and mouth it. He mouthed, he ate the top of it. So, so where are you? Is, did you already drive back to the boat ramp to fish so at this point? Okay. I am in sight of the boat ramp. Okay. So you with, made the move. Gotcha. So I made the run and I wanted to make sure that if I needed to, I could call Matt and he could tow me in or because we were in the same flight. I was the first flight. So he could tow me in the last you know, quarter mile, or if I need to, I can pick the trolling motor and I can put it on high and get back to the ramp. So I knew I was, I knew I was safe. Um, so I was kind of fishing with some peace of mind now. And yeah, first cast with the glide, he mouths it and I didn't get a good look at it. Um, I watched him behind it and, but I didn't know how big he was. And so I go to a dock and at this point I'm actually throwing the new Bass Mafia, um, dangerous swim bait. Cause I wanted, I just wanted to try it that week. And I took one cast and my bait hits the dock oh, and put it on an owner beast hook and the spring on the beast hook comes unhooked from the bait. So I'm like, and I got 30 minutes left and I'm like, what? I was like, all right, whatever. I'll just type another one. Next cast, the exact same thing happens. And I'm like, what is going on? And I was like, you know what? F it. I'm going to throw on my mag draft. Like I know how to throw it. And I throw the glide a little bit and I get to this dock and it was a huge dock. It was more of more a pier with boat slips and stuff. And I, and I skip my mag draft under the dock and I'm reeling it. And usually when they eat that thing, it's a jig bite. It's, you know, what's going on. And I was getting ticks and I'm like, what the heck? And then one like tick, I was like, okay, let me set the hook, set the hook. And I catch a three pounder. So I'm up to, you know, 13, 14. And that was kind of the number I had in my mind all day. I don't really know why, yeah. but that number just stuck in my head. Like I, somehow I knew I was going to catch um, 13 or 14. So at that point, 13, 14, you feel like, okay, I, I, I hit my goal. I, I, I said to my co I'm like, that's, that's making the most of your opportunities. Cause I, I practically didn't have a big motor cause I was a little nervous to, to try and start that up. But so I'm, inside of the boat ramp and I catch a three pounder and I'm like, this is awesome. Like we moved up. I don't even know how many spots that would have been probably, you know, 20 something spots in the placing. So I was pumped and I go around the dock to the other side, same dock. And I, and I cast my, my mag draft and a fish follows it to the boat. And I'm like, what the heck? I'm like, so it, my, my mind is going like, I figured something out cause that's, three bites on a swim bait um, in, in 10 minutes or whatever it was. Dude, this fish followed the mag draft to the boat five times in a row. Oh my gosh. And on the fifth time, I, I, I kneeled down as soon as I saw him. He followed it to the boat. I twitched it. He smoked it. And it was a 410 ah! with, with 20 minutes left in the day. So I, I boat flip it and, and I'm screaming. I'm, I'm so pumped. My co is pumped and, uh, I'm like, dude, we got to go. So I roll into weigh in 
And Dude, like, oh my god, what are the odds? The same damn fish that many times on a swim bait. Oh. I mean, and and it was, and looking back on it, it was the same size as the one that missed my my glide. And I didn't. You can't. It's hard to tell how big they are when they're swimming like that. So I thought it was just a keeper, maybe two or three pounds. But when he ate it, and I set the hook, he, he kind of. He like Bronze moved to the side and I was like, oh, I was like, that's that we need that fish. So oh. boat, boat flipped him and um yeah, rolled into weigh in. And I looked at my co and I'm like, I'm like, dude, I don't even know what I have. I just threw him in the I was so messed up that I'm I'm trying to cull. And I'm like, dude, we gotta go. And I throw my balance beam in the live well. <laughs> I'm I'm just a mess, dude. And I roll in and I'm like, dude, I don't even know what I have. Cause it, everything happened so quick. And he's like, you got close to 18, 19. I'm like, no way. And I said, I'm like, dude, I got like 14 or 15, which the math makes no sense. And I don't know why I thought that at all. It's big bass fog is what it is. And, and Matt rolls in because he was first flight too. And I'm like, he's like, you do good. And I'm like, I think I have like 14 or 15. Like I was, and I wouldn't lie to him. And he, he said I was BSing him. I would not lie to him. That was honest to God what I thought I had. And uh, yeah, I go, I go up. And and it goes 17 on the dot. The how big was your biggest fish? 410. I weighed it for big fish. And it, that's it, it's hard when you don't have like a five or six pounder in your sack to really tell because you can have 20 pounds with all fours and yeah. they all look about the same. It's it's just it's so hard to eyeball that stuff. It really but is. But that is such a great gut move by you. And, and again, it's just like you said, like the if your live scope plugged in earlier in the day. You might not go to that dock. Yep. I mean, shit. Like you were meant to like have this kind of finish to start off your year. And if if my starter battery doesn't die, I stay up there the rest of the day, and I maybe maybe catch another. I don't know, but I, I mean, I. It's just it's insane, dude. I mean, to catch those fish inside of the ramp with three or four boats around doing the same thing I was doing, trying to get a last minute fish. Um, you just. I couldn't have asked for a better, a better turnout. Now, was there, could you tell at the time if, when you looked around, was, did it seem like anybody else was throwing the big swim baits? I really don't know. I didn't get to get a good look at everyone. Um, I know the mag draft is a staple out there talking to, to buddies that fish there. They're like, they like throwing it. Um, and it's just a bait I have confidence in. I think it, it catches keepers and it catches big ones. So it, it's kind of the perfect tournament bait. Um, but I assume there were a lot of guys throwing the bigger swim baits. But I, what, I what size do you throw mag draft wise? I throw the six. Okay. Um, I've messed around with the five. I've messed around with the eight. Um, I, I like the way that the six is just it's better all around, in my opinion. And, and the best thing about a mag draft is it skips amazing because there's nothing to stop it. It's all rubber. So you can skip it a mile and uh, it's, it's the perfect dock bait. What is your setup for that? So I got it right here. This is a, that's the mag draft all, all chewed up. Nice. And I throw this on, this is a poison Shimano poison Adrena. It's a seven foot four. Um, that's kind of a sweet spot just for skipping docks and stuff. It's not too big, not too, you know, too long or anything. And it can handle that ounce, ounce and a half um, swim bait. And it'd be perfect for that same size glide bait. I think that's what it actually says, like big bait, fast moving, something like that on it. Um, but Shimano Poison Adrena, and I'm throwing a Shimano Corrado. This is a 200. Um, it's just it's just a workhorse. You can do this. You can use this reel for anything, and it's gonna it, it's not gonna fail you. It's a it's a I use it for punching, you know, glide baits, big stuff. And, and I, I blacked out. What did you say the line size was? <laughs> so I didn't even, uh, this is, um, it's a line company called Defiant. Um, Defiant. My buddy oh. Oliver got me on it and it's a heavy cover fluoro. It's actually, I think it's 23 and a half. Really? Yeah. So I, I've, I've thrown 20 on it and it works fine. Um, but I've kind of found throwing bigger the line, the easier it is to skip. Um, you don't get as much backlashes. So yeah, defiant. It's twenty three and a half, I think, or there might be twenty three, but it it's beefy. 
Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. Like, I mean, usually I think people, when they try to get into the big swim bait thing, I personally think a lot of them try, they undergun it. And you really do have to specialize with all your tackle if you're going to get into it. Yep. Now, what got you into that? Is that something that's a big bite on the Chickahominy River or something? Like, that's such a, a an interesting thing to get into. So that bait specifically, um, a few years ago, Brandon Polnick won a tournament here. And he was throwing an 8-inch one. And Eight. He kind of, I'll spill the beans, I don't mind, but um, he was, we have the dam on the Chickahominy River and it's a big fish spot. Everyone knows it. Um, and so what he was doing at low tide, this is my kind of my assumption, is there's a, there's these bars on the dam and at low tide, it exposes this bar and you can skip under it. And with, so with the water rolling over, you can skip under the dam. Yep. Right there. So I. I kind of got into it, throwing it there, um, made some money doing it. And then I started to fish it on docks and stuff on the chick. And dude, it gets you huge bites. And you're also going to catch, I've caught 12 inches on it. Like they're not afraid to hit it. So you can catch five in a day. It's not like a kind of a, it's not a Hail Mary swim bait. You, you can throw it from the beginning of the day to the end and you'll, you can catch a limit. What is a Hail Mary swim bait in your I, mind? I think of, kind of like your like your i don't even like just your bigger baits like glide baits things like that glide bait that's what i think of when i think of a hail mary kind of and i'll pick a glide bait up if i have five in the live well and i'm and i'm looking for one but yeah that kind of two to three to four ounce glide bait um you get up to that seven eight nine inch ones that's when i i think you know you're going for one bite have you had success with the glide bait or is that something you're just trying to now work into your arsenal? I haven't caught, I've caught like maybe five or something on a glide bait. It's not um, a specialty of mine. There's way more people that are way better at doing it. The way I use a glide bait is I'll make one cast with it. If I see a, a dock or something that lines up good with throwing it, I'll pick it up and I'll make one cast and it'll show you fish. It'll sometimes catch you a fish, but it's it's very situational for me. I'm I'm not the guy that's gonna throw it all day. I'm gonna make a couple of casts with it throughout the day. If it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But um I wonder why that is because if you look like some glide baits are the exact same size as a mag draft. And so it's so interesting that there are so many people that'll throw that mag draft and like you said, will have consistent success. Uh, maybe they don't catch a limit, but they'll catch a kicker. Yeah. But that glide bait, if for some reason, it's either like you're not going to catch anything or you're going to catch the next state record. Yeah, exactly. Like it's so weird how they're both the same size, but one is very, very select time and place that it'll work. And the other one, it, it always gets bit. I, I wish I knew what it was. I, I just, I, I throw what I have confidence in and I, the mag draft has not let me down. I'm going to keep throwing it. Do you change the hooks out at all or anything like that? Um, I keep everything the same. Same with my jerk baits. Um, I throw the stock mega bass hooks. Um, they get a little flack. People think that they bend out or break, and they do. But just real quick, because we're a mega bass dealer and I and I deal a lot with mega bass. Um, I personally, throughout the week, I kept all my hooks on. I didn't change any. I had rusty hooks. I had hooks that were bent out. I had hooks that were off. And I never lost a fish. So I, I use, I throw 11, I think it's 11.6 Defiant uh, Soft Fluoro. And I, I have no problems landing fish on those Mega Bass hooks. They, when they, I've had fish swipe at it, you know, hook them in the top of the head. They do not come off. They stick them. What? That's, that's so, man, I could just go into a whole thing about treble hooks and all that. Cause I, I think that stuff is absolutely fascinating. Um, like with the big swim bait thing, what other techniques would you consider yourself? Pick three that define you, I guess, is the way I'm trying to put it. I uh, I love a drop shot. That is kind of a staple for me. I, I throw it a ton on the river. Um, I throw eight or nine pound test on the river and people scold me all day. But dude, it, it catches fish. Um, that's definitely one that I say I'd have in my arsenal. Um, uh, a frog. I love a frog. So kind of the complete other end of the spectrum. I love a frog and a spinnerbait. Those, those I would say were my three that I, uh, I do well with in tournaments throughout the year. 
So those three in a mag draft. And so two out of the four sound like a river kind of yep. bait, a river rat bait. And the other two, you would think apps like California or something. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It's yeah. I mean, I, I, when I go to like a new lake, it's always a drop shot and a spinner bait. Those are like my two that I feel comfortable throwing around, especially on like Kerr, Smith Mountain, those type of lakes. Um, obviously not in this one, but those are two that I've confident in pretty much anywhere. Do you feel like Kerr and Smith are a lot alike or are they very different? Both. There, there's some places like um, I think docks really separate Smith Mountain. Um, they have, a, I think, way better docks to fish. Kerr has a lot of floating docks because of the water flux. Um, but they definitely set up similar with the brush pile bite, that kind of thing. Um, and just the size. They're both, I mean, Kerr's, Kerr's got Smith Mountain beat by quite a bit, but they're both just huge. And there's, there's definitely ways that they set up similar and there's a lot of ways that they're different. I feel like there's a lot of the, those lakes don't have as much dead water. I know Smith, for example, it, it doesn't have as much dead water. There's so many areas you can go there and fish. I guess on the other end of the spectrum would be like a Potomac river in the springtime where it's like, there's three creeks yeah. and that's it versus Smith where it's like the whole place could play. Yep. Uh, and it's very interesting. And then I, again, at Kerr, you also have the blueback herring situation down Lake, things like that. And I believe that's the next tournament on your schedule, right? Coming yep. up is Kerr. Yep. And I've got a little history there. Um, I actually just last October, I finished third in an ABA there. So it's definitely a place that I, I feel comfortable fishing. Um, so that'll be a, and that one, we have the Bassmaster open is the weekend before on bugs. That's so nice. it's going to be, I like it because I, I like it tough. I'd much rather it take, you know, high teens than, 20 something pounds to win. That's that that'll set up better for me, I think. Let's see. I'm trying to think. Wait, when is that tournament? Is it in April? The Kerr one is May 13th. May? The Bassmaster is May 6th. Oh, May 13th. Oh, yeah, we've got right. quite a quite a quite a bit of time until the next one. That's such a weird break. That's it is. Really. Yeah, I'm not sure what what happened, but I I like having it spaced out. You can kind of, you know, get your other tournaments in cuz April is such a busy month in the fishing industry. Are, are you stuff. are you just fishing the Piedmont? Are you also going to fish the Shenandoah division or what? This year, I'm just going to do the Piedmont. Um, okay. Since it's my first year, I'd love to get to a point where I'm fishing two or three divisions in a year. But I'm going to start with one. And my goal is to fish an entire division of the ABAs as well. Um, there's, I think there's maybe one tournament that there's an overlap. But um, our ABA division has like 10 something tournaments. So I'll be doing a ton of fishing. Wow. Dude, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, the other the other question I had for you is, is how is you talked about your forward facing sonar, and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about that. Like, is that a part of your game that you consider your strength or something that you're continuing to grow on? Uh, both. I feel like it's benefited me a lot in tournaments. Um, I might only catch one fish on it, but it could be a game changer. Like the ABA that I won, I had it's like 17 pounds until like two something, and I saw one on live scope and caught it on a chatterbait, and it put me over 18 which gave me the win. So I find it a lot. The biggest thing for me with, with live sonar is I don't use it to find fish. I use it for fishing, like cover, like brush piles and stuff. Because before that, I had no confidence in myself fishing out deep. I've caught fish on, you know, dropping straight down on them on sonar. But if I'm fishing a flat or a brush pile or something, I had no confidence. So being able to see my bait exactly where it is, kind of see where the fish are positioned, it just it gave me so much confidence in in fishing out deep that that was the biggest thing for me. It, yeah, because it's something that you almost need nowadays in your game. And it's always something interesting to see like how people like to use it, because everyone if I ask you or if I ask SB or if I ask Mr. McCluskey, I feel like I get a different answer on how they fish it in their game yep. style. And it's so interesting because people that hate on forward facing sonar, I don't think they truly understand. Like it, it, it's a tool. That's that we we've talked about that all week. And Matt is one of the best I've seen with live scope. Um, if he sees a fish on live scope, he has a hundred percent confidence that he can, he can catch it. And I'm not at that point, And I've learned a ton from him um, being able to watch him, especially at Smith mountain. I mean, he was catching fish on a, you know, that he was just seeing random one or two fish and he was getting them to bite. And that's not something that I can do, but it's something I'm, I'm definitely working on.
it's almost like sight fishing again. And the thing with I know for sight fishing is like, when do you leave them? Yep. And that to me is the issue. I feel like and not an issue, but a challenge is like, how do you know? Like, I got to go. I got to stop chasing this one and, and, and make that adjustment. I guess it's an instinctual thing, but I feel like that's also the biggest learning curve is to know when to when to move. I it's a, it's all instincts. I won't give a single fish and maybe that's my problem. I won't give them more than two or three casts. Um, especially in the tournament. I mean, if I saw a fish that was just by itself in oh, more than 10 feet of water, I wasn't casting at it because I just knew that's not my strong suit. And there's a 99% chance that I'm not catching that fish. So for me, I, I can, I'll take a few casts at it. And if it's not happening quick, I, I can pick the troll motor up and leave and go somewhere else. Mm, okay. That's, that's really good advice for everybody. Um, oh, the one thing we didn't, you also pal around with Oliver of big bass. Yeah. I don't, I think we talked about that off air and not yeah. on the show. So like, how did, how did you get involved with him? So he, he's one of the G most smart people I've met in the industry. So he came in, there was a Bassmaster open this year. I think it was in April. And uh, we had a ton of pros come in. We had Logan Parks here. We had Cody Bertrand, um, Jake Maddox, a lot of up and coming guys come to the shop. And he just kind of walked in and I was like, you know, I'm, and I'll admit, I was a little starstruck. I mean, that's Oliver and I. Um, so he walked in and, and we just got to talking and he kind of pulled me aside. And he was like, how would you guys feel about doing a store event? Because we carried a lot of products that he works with, like um, X Zone, Nichols and stuff like that and so he we ended up doing a store event we got a bunch of defiant gear in he him and um riley his his girlfriend who she's awesome and joe la barbara who's one of my favorite dudes uh they came they brought their boats parked them outside and uh yeah i kind of hit it off with oliver and uh, he asked me if i wanted to join the uh, dream team and i've been with him ever since so how does that work i mean do you have to like fly around the united states do tv appearances like what do you nope. he he kind of he wanted someone in that air that was an area that he didn't have anyone so he was like we want someone that can kind of take care of this area and you being on a fishery like a title chickahominy there's a lot of kind of knowledge and, and experience that i can bring to anglers that don't get to see that every day so he he's he's just he's been there's so many difficult things coming up in this industry right now with social media, YouTube, like you have to ha have to be doing that. So this was my first year really grinding the YouTube. So being able to shoot him a text, Hey, watch this video and, you know, give me a call. What, what can I do better? Same with Strykel. Um, They were both huge this year helping me really? out. So I, Oh yeah. Matt, <laughs> Matt's one of Matt's me and Matt are very close and, he is a straight shooter. He was like, dude, this sucks. Fix this. And I was like, okay. Or he's like, dude, this is really good. Keep doing this. And I built a great relationship with him and Oliver. Um, they both have, have helped me more than they know. Did somebody push you? Was it like, exactly. Like, was it Matt that pushed you? Like, Hey, you need to do your YouTube channel. Was this just you pushing yourself it, a little it, bit of everything? It's always been something I wanted to do. And I've always filmed but matt really pushed me he's like he's like you need to like take this seriously like this is what people look for um there's no more logos don't sell don't sell anymore just because you have a logo on your jersey you're not selling baits he's like you need to be able to present yourself well on social media you need to be able to put out quality youtube videos and so he de matt definitely pushed me in the right direction and he's been a huge mentor for me and um i just kind of fell in love with it dude like I, I challenged myself at the end of the year to put a video out every week and it caused me to fish more it caused me to film more and it was it was huge so i'd love to get to a point where maybe one day i'm doing that full time but we'll see we got a long way to go one video at a time exactly you know? and then on you know great segue there yeah um here we go, guys. And this is also, again, as always, link in the episode description, everything that we're talking about. Uh, your channel name is HPS Fishing. Uh, and then again, that's pretty good. You know, 16 videos, 179, 180, honestly, subscribers. Yeah. Uh, dude, how long have you been doing this for? So I think I 
been putting my first video i think was me winning on the on the aba but it was just a bunch of clips thrown together good start <laughs> but um yeah so i think i'm not even sure but wherever the that practice that chick river aba practice video that was the first one where i actually sat down and did an intro did editing and did an outro so months ago a year dude that's not long to be on youtube to have that many subscribers that's awesome yeah so um and i think this i think this bfl video coming about is going to be a is is going to be a pretty good one oh good you did okay you did gopro this i filmed every day of practice and i filmed the entire tournament um so it'll be i oh think my god you got your reaction to catching that that swim bait fish i will that's i will good. send that to you privately and it's pretty Dude, that's that's gonna be some gold though yeah. that would be some gold yeah if i can can i send it to you can you put it up on the video now just to give us can put it up yeah i can put it up on the video now if you want yeah let me let me dm this to you real quick yeah, um, absolutely just this Thinking. this this is gonna be let's see if i can get it sent yeah that's freaking that's freaking awesome no, that's the hardest thing with YouTube. And again, like I'm not, I'm not any fancy YouTube or anything else, yeah. but it is, it, it's just a slog of just being consistent. Yeah. It's um, that's the hardest part, dude. Uh, I'm really going to challenge myself um, starting with the vi the practice video that's hopefully dropping this week is going to be at least one video, hopefully two a week till the end of the year is the plan. Okay, so it's it you're you're casting this way, correct? That, that's Next the exact cast. Yep. So I made that okay. cast um up four times before this and followed it to the boat. He he ate once and he just didn't get it. Um, so I was a little nervous he wasn't gonna eat, but I you can see my drop shot rod that was ready to go if he if he came again. And um, but yeah, I made that same exact cast and every time he followed it. So this was the fifth cast. Come on, dude. That joint. You is Come on, dude. Ah, work that fish. Come on. That's a five pounder. You got Skittles, son. Come on. See, you got Skittles? <laughs> I don't know what that means, <laughs> but he, he it. <laughs> and it just amped me up. Oh, you got Skittles, son. Dude, that is legendary. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. Oh. I mean, dude, you just can't, you can't make that stuff up, but you can't. And it's just when it's again, I'll keep it when it's your time, it is your time. And people don't understand that there's no, like you can say winning formula and putting yourself in the best situation, but in the end of the day, it's just, if it comes up roses, man, you can't do any wrong. Yeah. I know uh Hunter Shrock had one video when he made the elites. He's like, he's like, when it's your time, it's your time. He's like, not even I could mess it up. Um, mm -hmm. just there's nothing I could. And, um, I mean, obviously I didn't win, dude, but it felt, it feels like it was such an unreal experience. I, I get off stage and, um, I weighed in seven. I think the second bag was at that point was like 12 pounds. So I get off stage and I get a video. Um, it was actually my grandparents 60th anniversary and they were having an anniversary party up in New York. And my dad was there, um, or he would have been at the tournament, but I get a video dude. And it's my whole family watching me on live weighing in and they're all cheering and it was it was an unbelievable experience and then i get i find out my houston grandparents are watching um uh, my buddies at home are watching so it was it was definitely an experience that dude i, I will not forget it, congratulations that, dude that's freaking awesome it was and very cool i mean i guess like just to kind of to put a bow on this thing for today like i mean it is what are your overall goals is it just to qualify for the for the all-star event or like i mean you tell everyone at home what your goals are for this year. So for this year, it's it's definitely to make the regional on the Potomac. Um, that's a body of water I haven't been to. And I I just wanted to see kind of where I stack up um, to see if I'm ready. Um, I've done well, like I said, in the ABA and the local level. So I wanted to see how I stacked up against the regional guys. Um, but yeah, I just want to see where I stack up this year and, and want to make the regional. Um, now, honestly... I won't lie to you. I have my sights set on AOI. I would, I'm going to work my ass off and I'm going to go for it. Um, I've, I've got the start. Um, we got Kerr next, um, then High Rock, which I've never been to. Then we're at my home body of water on the James. And then we ended at Kerr again. 
So I, I want to, I'd love to win it my first year. And, and that's definitely a goal. Do you think fishing, and I've, I love having this conversation with people about the BFLs versus like Toyota's multi-day versus one day and, and, and money aside, finances aside, when you fish a single day, I, I personally believe to set the stage that it's hard to have that as a view of an angler because it's just one day. And when I, when I look at, you know, the guys that went with 22 pounds, the difference between you and the guy that won it is one bite. Yep. But it, if you go have to go back out there a second day or a third day, it really kind of shows who actually has a consistent pattern because there are a bunch of people that probably 16 pounds, 17 pounds, and they're in 11th place. They don't, do very well financially but they do that three days before they win so what i'm trying to tie this into is when you're fishing a single day event are do you fish a strategy of just you know swing for the fence or are you doing a hey listen i'm thinking points i'm just trying to be in the mix what is your strategy going on? i'm looking mostly at points um like i said if i had 10 or 11 pounds this i was going to chalk this up as a win because this did not set up like a tournament i should have done well in I, like I said, I like tough tournaments. I like when it takes, you know, 16, 17 to 19 pounds to win. Um, when it's a slug fest and they were calling for, I personally, I thought it was going to take 25. That's where my mind was at. I think the wind and the rain really messed guys up. But I was looking for to kind of lay up at this tournament because it just, I'm not a pre spawn guy. I'm a late summer, um, you know, when it's tough. So I was going to, and with the schedule being like it is, May post spawn is our next tournament. So I'm like, the rest of the schedule set up really well. So I was, my goal was to get out of here with 10, 11 pounds, maybe a top 50 finish and move on to the next one. So I was definitely thinking about points more than doing well. But then I saw how good I was fishing during practice. And I was like, okay, this is going to, this is going to get interesting. I actually asked Matt um, when we were just hanging out Friday, I was like, if someone at blast off came up to you and said here is 14 pounds and you're not you can't go over or under like are you taking that and he's like no he's like the way practice has been you know i think the opportunity for a big bag through one of us is there and i was like i'm 100 the same way so my mindset really changed um after practice hunter again i can't thank you enough on such a short notice coming on this show and, and being so transparent um guys i mean this he just gave so much great information on how to become a better angler um and then how you don't have to come from a family that has like six generations of anglers to get involved you just got to grind and and you're gonna have lucky breaks and things are gonna build on it and then i i can't wait to see you after the next tournament to see kind of the results and, and where you head with this um is there any sponsors more that you'd like to plug or anything else you have coming up you'd like to tell everyone about yeah so definitely fishing pro tech and big bass dreams um like i said lynn supported me since day one and uh, oliver has has done a lot for me lately um those are the two that i'm working with right now um really i want to just shout out my family um my mom and dad have been huge they go to every single tournament they can. Uh, we were all kind of in different places this time, so they couldn't make it, but they were watching on live and texting me the whole day. And um, I had, like I said, my whole extended family was watching uh, in New York and Houston, and I had friends. So just thank you to all the people that are supporting me and all the new supporters. And yeah, stay tuned because we're gonna we're gonna hit it hard this year. Guys, again, link in the episode description to his YouTube channel, all this social media, and all the sponsors down below. Please give this guy a like and subscribe. He's going to go a lot of places. And again, guys, please like and subscribe to the channel uh, to Fishing the DMV. We are the fastest growing outdoor fishing podcast show in the DMV area. We're going to be talking, but we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye, guys. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.